All right, welcome to our talk on the future of AI. <laughs> Blake Griffin, Ryan Khalil, thanks for joining. Your athletic accomplishments need no intro, but the founders of Mortal Media, the com production company behind the new White Man Can't Jump, uh, Hello Tomorrow, and projects set up everywhere. Uh, thanks for joining. Yeah, thanks, thanks for, for having us. us. Appreciate it. Um, we'll start off with a real quick speed round. Top three favorite movies of all time. Ryan, you go. Oh, jeez. Uh, I'm a bit of a fanboy. I love, I grew up on George Lucas and, uh, and huge stop motion fans. So Typical football player. I know. So a lot of the Star Wars <laughs> franchises and all the Lucas film stuff. Nice. How about you? Uh, I'm a huge comedy fan, so super bad, uh, old school. Classic. Um, and then I'll, I'll go Dark Knight just to, just to, just not, to, balance be, it out. Just to not be the, oh, he only loves comedy guy. <laughs> so you guys both love movies. Uh, you guys are introduced by Thomas Toll, the CEO of Legendary, become friends, and then eventually start this company together. How, how does the conversation, take us through to the beginning, how the conversation goes from like, hey, we're, we really love movies to like, let's actually start something together. I think we both uh, were incredibly self-aware at, you know, the mortality of uh, a professional athlete's uh, shelf life. And, um, you know, we, we've always been competitive, always hard workers, but I think early on we were really looking at what that sort of second career might look like. We had a lot of great mentors who played, who were getting into a lot of different things. And we both had these very early um, ambitions to get into storytelling and and just really always had these creative bugs that both and I really uh Blake and I shared with early on in our friendship and so for us we always wanted to find a way to get into this town um there were a few athletes that were starting to do it uh Blake and I didn't wake up one day and think the world needed another you know athlete production banner but we really really wanted to uh do it in, in a real way. We wanted to make sure we did it in a way that didn't feel like a vanity project. Yeah. Um, and so we kind of just took the lessons of our sports careers and applied it to this. We sort of kept our head down. We went to work. We tried to be sponges and find mentors in, in this town and, and really try to figure out where we might, um, you know, not only learn, but use whatever sort of experiences or, or talents we may have right away out the gate. And, um, and that's what we did. We spent, um, we had different off seasons. So we spent our off seasons uh, sort of out there networking, meeting with a whole lot of different folks, meeting with younger writers, younger executives. Um, what, what was it? So maybe Blake for you, each of you could have gone on out on your own. What was it about, you know, the relationship you guys had that was like, hey, let's go, let's do this together. I think our, our sensibilities were, were very similar. Um, he, 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 like you said, he spans, spans more genre, fanboy, sci-fi, um, and I love comedy, but in a perfect world, we sort of find that intersection. So um, Spaceballs? Yeah, exactly. Spaceballs <laughs> too coming soon. Um, so just, just finding those sensibilities, but also we, we'd known each other since 2000, what, 10? Yeah. Um, and and kind of kept track of each other's projects. And, um, you know, there's something to athletes sort of being able to, to talk to each other a certain way. Um, we always tell people that we, we have projects with, like, we are very used to criticism and we're very used to it just being right in front of your face. I mean, we go into a film room the day after a game and, you know, the coach <laughs> doesn't say the nicest things for the next hour or so. And then you hear it all week, so... Um, we're always, we always try to be very just upfront with people and say like, you know, this is how we work and you're, you're very welcome to, to, um, you know, reciprocate that for us. Um, but you know, since we've started, it's been, it's been great. Yeah. So you guys are in, in your athletic careers are all pro all-star everything. And now you're rookies again, basically. Pretty how much. do you go about bridging that education gap and experience gap. I think a lot of founders do that. We're going to disrupt this new industry, but I don't know anything about this industry. How, how, how do you begin to bridge that gap? Well, I think again, just, I think the, the one thing we brought from our athletic careers is resiliency. It's, it's a lot of rejection. It's a lot of, uh, you know, people telling, you no. and the athlete part of it helped us get in rooms, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee producing something or yeah. getting a green light on anything. And so, I think for us, we really, uh, we don't get deterred easily and it's been very helpful for us to keep pushing and keep pushing and, and you know, we, had, we, we have a lot of people too in our corner, you know, agents, managers who are also helping try to steer and sometimes we kind of push against that. So I think for us really finding our own voice and finding our own path and not being too deterred by 
you know, kind of falling on our faces uh, is something that we've been able to really apply to this and, and it's been helpful for us. How do you balance? You get a lot of smart people like, oh my gosh, this guy made all these movies, some of my favorite movies and now he or she's telling me this and then, but you also have your gut instinct and what you want to do and what you want to put out in the world. How do you balance between the wisdom of the feedback you're getting and going also sometimes like, nah, we want to do it differently? Yeah, I mean, again, not to not to bring every question back to sports, but it's something I learned early <laughs> tell on. Tell us more. <laughs> um, it's all we know, guys. Just stick, stick with us here. Uh, you know, early on, you, you learn to become a leader of a team. You know, it's, it's about how you talk to people. It's about managing egos. Um, and I, I mean egos in, in a good way. Like, we all have egos to yeah. a certain extent, right? And um, learning how to talk to people um, and, and learning – you know, what's super important to you because these projects these have they we have our names on these projects as well so um being able to, to pick and choose what's most important um and i always i always feel like for us it's about getting it right not being right um so so being able to to stand up and say something when when you feel like something's not working or, or something might be wrong or we could do it a different way but if somebody comes back and they present a better option best idea wins so uh Again, it's always about sports is great because it humbles you and you get humbled every single day. Um, so we're sort of used to that. And, and I think it's important to carry that over into pretty much every walk of life. Yeah. Um, is to never think that, you know, just because you've had success before means you deserve, you know, success in the future. Yeah. Um, Ryan, you mentioned, um, you know, sports helping you open doors. But I think uh, what, in my conversation with people, a lot of times it happens, it comes also with a skepticism. It's like, ah, okay, here, Blake and Ryan, they're going to pitch us blindside, but with a white guy. Like, <laughs> yeah. what, how, how do you earn the trust? How Great do you... Idea, yeah. <laughs> hey, we, we can talk about that later. <laughs> it's pretty fire. Um, yeah, I, we knew pretty early we were going to carry that stigma. Mm -hmm. And I know pretty early we wanted to be taken very serious again we knew a lot of athletes who were sort of trying to uh just put their name on a poster and for us it it was a lot deeper than that and so um we just kind of we took a lot of advice we listened to a lot of folks i mean early on a lot of our reps really were pushing sports related content towards us because it felt like a much faster fast track yeah and we really pushed it away aside from white man can't jump which was just uh, the people involved with it and obviously the, the title were, it was just too hard to pass up. Although we spent a lot of time trying to figure out what's our own twist on it. We knew trying to remake a classic, there'd be a lot of baggage to that. So, um, and I think we did a good job making it for a new audience. Um, and, um, and then obviously the success of that with Hulu uh, reward us in that. But I think the thing that we really did early on was sort of trust our gut and really fight hard for the things that we love more and really not try to sort of take the easy layup, so to speak, because none of it's easy anyways. Yeah. You know, even, even those kinds of projects that seem like, oh, these are quick paths to get made, it's still a lot of work and it's hard when you love it. So we just, we kind of early on decided we, we would only pursue the things that we really love because we knew how hard it was gonna be um, and I'm glad we stuck with it, even though we kind of got a lot of eye rolls early on about not just jumping on something. Yeah. Transitioning back into sports a little bit. Uh, you guys both played in your, your careers was a time where really data and transformed the way the sport is played for both of you. Talk a little bit about your relationship with data, you know, both as an athlete, athlete, but now, you know, algorithms are figuring out what people should watch, you know, on streaming platforms and whatnot. How, how, what was your relationship with data as players and then now as you guys look to what you want to make? I mean, I think data and analytics is, is super, super important. Um, I think uh, being able to apply it in, in, in a real sense is, is also is probably more important. Um, I always use the analogy. A lot of people ask me about analytics in, in basketball. I always use the analogy of, you know, knowledge is knowing a tomato is a fruit and wisdom is knowing not to put it in a fruit salad. So <laughs> sure, you can have all this data and you can have all these analytics, but if you don't apply it the right way in a practical way, it could steer you in the wrong path, a path that you don't want to go down. Uh, so I think being smart about it is, is the most important thing. And again, removing your ego of like what you see uh, or what, what the, pr the point you want to prove you know, especially in basketball, you can make up a stat that will support any argument you want. Oh, we should play this player more. We should do this more. Um, and I think that applies to, to business as well. So, 
you know, just having the, the wherewithal to, to know like, all right, maybe, maybe I need to take a st step back from this, this data and, and be able to apply it a little bit better. Yeah. You guys both throughout your careers played for some legendary coaches. Uh, any of the lessons, whether from college through pros or high school that kind of stick with you guys that are really uh, helpful in, in this endeavor? Um, yeah, I mean, too many to name, I think. Uh, but again, it's for us, it's, it's, um, all the experiences we've had, uh, we just try to apply in everything that we do and, and everything that we know. And, and, um, I mean, I could rattle off a lot of really bad, uh, sports sayings, but I won't do it. Uh, but we keep them. Score we keep more them. points yeah, than exactly. the other team. <laughs> exactly. Um, but yeah, there is, uh, there's a natural competitiveness to, uh, a lot of endeavors outside of sports. And so we, you know, we've learned a lot from having those experiences and, and having those great mentors that really had a huge impact on us. And, and again, we're applying it here, but also finding our own voice and finding our own way into it. And, and it's not the same. And, and um, so I think it's always a balance. It's a balance of finding people who that you look up to, finding people that are doing it the right way, but still, again, finding a path that works for you. How long was it before you guys felt like you found the voice in what you wanted to do? <laughs> I think we're so yeah, we're still still searching, <laughs> still a little searching, bit. yeah. Um, it's kind of a never-ending quest. I mean, it's like, and, and that's sort of how I, I I think it should be the entire way. I, I think if we ever feel like we have found exactly what we're doing and we know what we're doing, we know how to do it. I think we've probably messed up somewhere. Um, like that challenge of like always pushing forward and, and being a little bit more forward thinking. And that's sort of what we talked about, especially during the writer's strike. We basically moved into the Sony offices. We had our first look deal at Sony and the writer's strike happened. And we're kind of sitting there like, all right, well, what do we do now? But it kind of gave us a good, good opportunity to sort of to get together internally, meet a bunch of people at Sony and, and sort of look at like the future or like what we think could be the future. And we've leaned on mentors for that. And you can kind of see the direction it's going, but again, trying to be ahead of that direction is what we what we spent a lot of time on over the past year or so. Yeah, you guys talked earlier about dealing with rejection. What was it about sports that you think supercharged your ability to deal deal with that? And like, how do you process rejection and deal with that? <laughs> um, I mean, obviously, the example of just hearing no a lot when you get really excited by an idea and you think you have an amazing package and it's just a no brainer and for whatever reason, it, it doesn't go. Um, to uh, Blake and I being very used to um, journalists writing negative things about us, uh, and so no, that never so, happens. So yeah, critics uh, <laughs> critics critics don't phase us uh, as much as they did when we were much younger. Uh, is that just a matter of reps? Just hearing it the first time is like, oh, why are they? And then just thickening your skin? Or I think it's tough. I mean, Blake and I, we came, I, at least for me, I'm a little bit older than Blake. I came into the National Football League into a locker room where guys were playing cards on boxes and everybody was very sort of um, isolated from the world to my last year in the National Football League, everybody was at their locker on their cell phone. And I was like, man, this is, this is a crazy kind of... Uh, flashback picture I had leaving. And so social media changed so much and how it sort of infects uh, not only a team, a locker room, but an individual. And, and that was really hard. Even having sort of the life skill set to deal with criticism, once social media came in, even as like an old head, you were still, it doesn't matter, but then you would check and listen and read and listen. And, and you, you know, we're human. You can't help but let that affect you in, in you a negative a way. Account? And so I did not have a burner account, no. Uh, I did not have a burner account, but I did burn the account eventually because I was like, man, I can't read this. And so I really tried towards the end of my career to help younger guys because you could really see it affect them. Yeah. So we've taken that into this, which is, you know, we, um, we listen, but we don't let it sort of affect how we make decisions. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier, you guys kind of, laid low, really learned the business, and then probably in the past year or two started talking a little bit more publicly as these projects come to fruition. And just as you start talking publicly, boom, the writer strike happens and the actor strike happens. And uh, you guys end up making this investment in Swaybox. Maybe if we could cue the sizzle.
Incredible stuff. So talk us through the thought processes. You guys are, you know, how, how did this deal come about? What got you guys excited about what they're doing? Yeah, I mean, uh, like Blake was saying, during the strike, we sort of kind of were at a standstill. There wasn't a lot of movement on the projects that we had going. And so it gave us time to reflect and be a little bit more entrepreneurial and kind of figure out, well, okay, well, how can we be more additive? We have a lot of these connections and a lot of these kind of deals come across our desk. And, um, and this one was this kind of scrappy studio out of New Orleans, and they were doing some really cool stuff with machine learning and um, puppetry. So... Blake and I, we've been incredibly sensitive to the creative community in terms of all this sort yeah, of AI stuff and like, everything yeah. that's happening. And, and we really found this cool balance with this team where they have this incredible group of craftspeople who are still building practical things and designing practical things. But then they're using machine learning on their own art, on their own um, work. Um, and doing it in a way that allows them to really blow it out and, and do it in a way that is a fraction of the traditional cost of animation and, and um, only almost like a quarter of the time. So we just felt like that would be something that would be really enticing to studios and the early projects we've been developing them with them uh, have been that. It's really gotten a few studios excited, especially Sony. We have a couple projects that we're working on there, but we just really fell in love with them and, and the way they went about it. Um, and so, yeah, this is something we feel like uh, a lot of folks are sort of trying to find ways where they can be more additive. And this was one that we got really excited about. Yeah. Yeah. And, and on, it sort of goes back to the thing of, of being able to apply and use AI in the right way. Like you said, like they are true artists. They're a group of artists creating this uh, incredible stuff at a fraction of the cost, at a fraction of the time. Um, but they're also applying the right data and AI to be able to, to scrub some of the stuff that they don't need to actually do by hand that would take much longer. So again, for artists, they're able to put more work out. They're able to do a, a better job. They're able to do the things that they want to do uh, faster and more efficiently. So for us, like leading this, this round for Swaybox was, was super important because we are embracing AI, but you're embracing it to empower artists. And I thought that, and we thought that was like super important for, for, for them. And that, the video you saw was super, super early proof of concept stuff. The, where they are now uh, is pretty incredible. They have a few projects with some pretty astounding filmmakers. I don't know if I'm allowed to say this. One of them is Matt Reeves and it's <laughs> the stuff that they're doing is so cool. Yeah. Um, sorry, author, if I get in, tr get in trouble. <laughs> It is amazing yeah. the stuff that they're doing. So I can't wait for people to see it. And, and the efficiency of their, of their pipeline is so incredible. And so we're so excited for the projects we're working on with them. Um, but yeah, more I to think come. that's like a underappreciated part of it. Like if you can change the financial equation, everybody complains about, oh, is everything's a remake, a reboot, a, uh, you know, but when you're spending a hundred million plus on a movie, you don't want to take risks. So you build it on something existing. I think if you yeah. can change the math, it actually allows more creative swings to make crazy stuff. Well, that's exactly right. And it also, it, this came out of necessity for Blake and I, because we've really been on a path to create original stuff. Um, and, uh, and so for us, it's, it's how do you make that as risk averse for the studios as possible? Cause to your point, they can't really justify doing it unless it's attached to a big known IP. And so I think there's a balance of it. And I still think that's not going away anytime soon, but if we can find ways to really bring the cost of emission down for the studios with something that is a little bit riskier and, and more original, I think that's really exciting for us. And so for Blake and I, we're, we're dabbling in both um, in terms of our relationship with Swaybox yeah. And it's been the most fun that we've had um, and the most rewarding creatively too. Yeah, the budget thing has been has been huge and we've learned that early on. You know, we'll have some projects and we're, we're taking it in. We're like, man, we could we could do a great job at 20 million. That sounds like a lot. But then you go in and you're like, all right, let's like, let's like slow play this a little bit and be like, oh, you know, all we need is 15 million. And they're like, can you do it for five? And we're like, ah, shoot. <laughs> we kind of <laughs> kind of cut ourselves, cut ourselves yeah. down there. So anytime we can, we can create something uh, for a, a lower budget, get it done quicker and, and have it look just as good, if not better. Uh, you know, it's super important for us, obviously. Yeah. And I've heard you guys talk a lot about, you know, just wanting to make things that you would want to see yourselves. But how you watch things is changing. You know, I don't know if you guys, do you guys have Apple Vision Pros? We do. Yep. Like it? Don't like it? What do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm pretty bullish on spatial computing. I think it's the future. I don't know if, I don't know if this generation's the one, but I, you can see it a few years uh, or a few models down uh, of 
sort of the kind of Tony Stark glasses that everybody's wearing and, and uh, enjoying entertainment that way. So we're, we're also dabbling in that space. There's a couple of companies that we've been looking at in spatial computing, um, especially as it relates to 3D streaming, we think is, is going to be a problem that somebody's going to solve. So that's been fun to mess with as well. Yeah. You keeping yours? You gonna hit the courts? I do. I I love it. I just got it like a couple of weeks ago, and I've been messing around with it. But it's also like a little embarrassing. My girlfriend took a video of me like in my room, like you know, like trying to like move stuff around. It's like when you see yourself as video of yourself using yeah. it, and you're like, oh, it's not as cool as I thought it was. Uh, but it's so cool. Like in my head, it looks so much cooler. Yeah, yeah. You have no idea. Just wait till you see it. Yeah. Um, but it is like so interesting and, and like Ryan yeah. said, we've, we've been trying to figure out ways to sort of implement what we do and, and take advantage of that space because like you said, I think, you know, every generation of the new thing that comes out is not going to be the best one. Two, three generations of the, the Vision Vision uh, Pro is going to be pretty, pretty special. Blake and I have been working on a demo of Blake showing us how to shoot a free throw and it's really incredible. Yeah. It's like, you know, they have those kind of masterclass things, but... 2D, you're dependent on whoever sets up the cameras. And we just thought, what a crazy, cool idea to have an immersive experience with an instructor. You know, especially in that field, somebody of his caliber, we think would be really, really cool. So that's that's almost done and it's it's turned out great. I wasn't known as a free throw shooter and it wasn't my idea to pick free throws. <laughs> this is true. But <laughs> I made a few, so. <laughs> you'll, still, you'll still be most of the people in this room, so, you know, we're convinced. <laughs> um, well, guys, uh, I, I think if you're not involved with Hollywood, it's... It, uh, easy to not appreciate how hard it is to get something made. I'm sure like t to this day, Martin Scorsese is probably trying to get a project made. So the fact that you guys have already have the track record that you do, I think speaks to the way you guys have approached things. And so thanks for joining us. We can't wait to see the rest of your slate come to life. Thanks appreciate so much. It. Thanks Thank for you having us. Appreciate it. Blake and Ryan. Oh.